at 6.30, and we'll have some fellowship time afterwards. Um, and uh, this is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Sunday morning, and then we'll do the whole thing the night of the 18th. And while we're waiting for the 
choir to get back. I would personally like to thank Annie and Brody for leading the music last Sunday. We are so grateful. Now that the choir has gotten back and been seated, I'm going to make them stand as well as you.
And, and as he sat there, and, and of course we did this in a group, so I'm sitting here with another 10 people on staff, including Laura, and, and he says, you know, Dwight, your, your results pretty much say you don't want anybody to tell you what to do, but you want to tell everybody else what to do. Like, thanks a lot, Brian, that's what I needed in front of everybody else. But there's, you know, there's just that, re that reality there, that, that, that sense of, you know what, I've got to take care of it myself. I've got to get it done on my own. And one of the things that that's kind of caused in my life is, is a sense of really not learning from people, because Brian really took it to heart. And he decided, well, I just won't tell the white what to do. And on the one hand, it was nice to have the flexibility, and a lot of great things happened in ministry, but there were many times where I was wandering around on campus kind of going, what do I do now? And I'd call Brian, and he'd say, I don't know, how do you feel God leading you? This was not very helpful in terms of giving me direction. It went on even when I was working in my little, uh, my little peon job in the, in the church down when I was in seminary. And one of the interesting things about this, I don't know whether this was directly related to me, but I arrived there, and a week after I became the Evangelism Explosion Intern, which the length of the title lets you know just how important my position was, but a week after I was there, the pastor preached a sermon, and at the end of the sermon let us all know that he was leaving for a church half our size, ten miles away. And... We had no senior pastor, big kind of mega church thing, until a month before I left. So we were kind of lacking in leadership. And then, about six months after he left, I had been hired by the singles director. You see, it was the it was our education guy, and then over him was the you know under him was the singles guy, and then the singles guy was the head of evangelism, and I was one of the evangelism employees. So just so you know how important it was. Anyway, so. Six months after I get there, Charles comes to me and says, well, you know, when the writing's on the wall, because, you know, when we get a new guy, he's going to come and bring his whole team. So just to let you know, I'm leaving and going to the mega church across the way. And so now, not only do we not have a senior pastor, but my boss just quit. And the boss over him, Nat had a uh, hands-off approach to, to guidance and leadership. He had so much to oversee and so much to do. I think I had two conversations with him during the two years I was employed there. The thing about it is, I was able to do my own thing, my own way. And on the one hand, that was good in some ways, but it left me wasting a lot of time, doing things in a poor way when somebody else could have told me the right way to do. And when it came time for my eventual job search, as I was looking for a job getting out of seminary, it never occurred to me that Nat, the education pastor of a church of over 800 and one of the big churches in that part of Texas, could maybe help me find a good job. I did it all through the seminary. I did it all on my own. And the reality is that I really believe that I missed opportunities for effective ministry of evangelism in that church by my bullheadedness. And I've missed opportunities not only in ministry, but in many other places in my life by figuring that I had to do it myself. And it wasn't worth bothering somebody else to ask them to help me out. It wasn't worth bothering somebody else to get their advice and find out what would be a better way of doing it. You know, the reality, though, is that I think that I'm not the only one who feels like that. I think that we all kind of struggle with it. In fact, there's a song that was more popular then, but it's still a little bit popular now. And it's, it's, it's a lady, she's breaking up with her, with her boyfriend. And one of the key lines of the song is, Who died and made you king of anything? And it's, it's basically, you know, that the guy has been telling her what to do and how to do the right thing and how to live her life. And, you know, guys, we never do that, right? Never in relationships, no, no. But, and, and, and one of our lines in there is, look, I'm not drowning. I don't need you to rescue me. And I think that that is so much a part of our makeup as human beings, and even more so our makeup as Americans. When you think about the history of our country, this idea of a rags to riches story is foundational from the very beginning. We've got Benjamin Franklin writing story after story, and then shaping the events of his life 
to show himself as a rags to riches story. This idea that if I just get up enough gumption, if I just pull myself up by my bootstraps, if I just do a penny saved is a penny earned and, and do the right things, then I can make my way in the world, that I can be a self-made person. It's a part of, of who we are and I want to do that. But you know what the reality is? We're not. Because whether it was that teacher or that Sunday school leader, or that grandparent, or that aunt, or that uncle that took interest in someone and showed them a better way of life than the one they were a part of, that led them out of where they started. Whether it was that boss who gave someone a break in their first job, or that friend who had the right piece of advice at the right time to help somebody shape their college application, we all have received help. We've all received tremendous amounts of help from other people. We've all been rescued from our own inability, our own incompetence, our own deciding to do it by ourselves. We like to think that we are where we are because I have worked hard and I have done what needed to be done and I've been faithful to the path before me and that's made me strong and able and put me where I am. But the reality is that every one of us is incredibly dependent on the people around us, dependent on our parents, on our grandparents, on our relatives, on the friends we grew up with, on the teachers who taught us, on the Sunday school leaders who loved us, on the choir teachers who got us to sing, on all of the people that have been a part of our life to help lift us to where we are. Because without their inspiration, without their strength, without their power, we would not be the people we are today. The reality is that our spiritual life is not any more self-made than anything else. Because the truth is that we needed rescue. Because the truth is that our natural inclination as human beings is to figure out what we want to do and find a way to justify it. Find a way to rationalize it. Find an excuse for the behavior that we prefer. And by doing that, we walk away from what we know God wants for our life. From what we know is God's best for our life. And we justify it to ourselves. It's impossible for us to get everything right in the spiritual arena. And so what God did is he sent Jesus to rescue us. To come to us in our, in our abandonment of God. In our rejection of his ways. And to say, I will love you. I will care for you. I will bring you into the kingdom through my blood, not your effort. And then the Holy Spirit will fill you and strengthen you and make you able to follow me. Zechariah's song celebrates the sufficiency of God. Zechariah's song celebrates the fact that God did not leave us to get out of our problems on our own, but that he came and he saw our pain, he saw our sorrow, he saw our shortcomings, and he rescued us, even when we were convinced we needed the rescue. In Luke 1, starting in verse 67, I just give you a little background here. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. His wife Elizabeth and he were past the usual age of childbearing when God sent an angel to him to let him know that his wife was going to be pregnant and that that child was going to be the one who came before the Messiah. He didn't believe the angel, and because of his questions, he was not able to speak until the child was born. At that time, as the time came to name him on the eighth day, Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, knew the boy's name was supposed to be John. He, she let the crowd know that, let the family members know that, and said, the boy's got to be called John. And I, no, 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 we're going to name him Zechariah after his dad, because that's what you did to show that the firstborn was legitimate. And so finally, she says, look, ask his father. And they had him write down, and he wrote down, his name is John. At that moment, Zechariah was able to speak, and this is what he said. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. When you redeem something, you go and you pay for it. When you redeem something, you go and you, you finish paying off what you deposited, get the full price, and you bring it in. You bring it home. You make it your own. What God did in sending Jesus is he redeemed us. We already belong to him. 
but we walk away from Him through our sin, through our desire to do our own thing and ignore what God has called us to be and to do. And that as a result of that, we were separated from Him. So what Jesus did is He came to pay for that sin. When He did so, we were able to be close to God the Father once more. He redeemed us out of our fallen state and brought us to God the Father. Not only does He come and redeem us, but it says that God has raised up a horn of salvation for us from the house of His servant David. That God understood we could not save ourselves. We could not get it right. We could not pay for all the things that we've done wrong before and then live a perfect life after that. And so what He does is He sends salvation, saving from our sins to us, that He raises it up in a way that we would never have expected. That from the human house of David, God raises up Jesus. That he is counted of the line of David. He would be a king of Israel. And Israel still had kingdoms and a kingship. But that in that way, he came and he lived and he experienced our life so that he would know how we feel and what we go through. That we would have a savior, one who brings the salvation to us, who understood what we didn't do. He goes on. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. When we look at Jesus, we see that he steps into history, not in a vacuum, but with this long history of prophecy all the way through the Old Testament, pointing to him, pointing to where he'd be born, pointing to the events of his life, pointing to the genealogy that he comes from, pointing to who he is, and that Jesus fulfills all of these prophecies. Showing that he is the Messiah, the chosen one of God, who comes here for us. And that God did not want us to be ignorant or to miss him. But instead that he warned us ahead of time that he was coming. And that he was coming as a salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. That reality that as God works in our life and we follow Christ, that he does indeed shield us from the difficulties around us. He teaches us and makes us able to deal with them. And he makes us able to serve him in the midst of it. And when we do so, when we do that, we see our problems with our enemies, the frustrations of our life, be reduced and be less. It says that he came to show mercy to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue from the hand of our enemies, and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all of our days. That as we look to that passage, what we see is that God says he has made a promise. That he has obligated himself to us. That he promised them the Father at the beginning of the Jewish people. But he promised us as well that he would be there for us. That he would be on our side. That he would be watching out for us. That he would be protecting us. So that nothing could come into our life but that which he allowed. That which would build us and grow us and make us something else and something better than what we are. That reality that he swore an oath to Abraham that he would come and he would send the Messiah to save us. To make it so that for all time we can be with him and know him. So that we can feel his love in our day-to-day -day life. And be near him. God sends Christ to rescue us. Not only because we need him, but because he made a promise and God keeps his promises. One of the joys that we have in reading God's Word is seeing and knowing the things that He promises to us about watching over us, about loving us, about the fact that He will always be faithful to us, that no matter how we disobey Him, He will never cast us aside, but will always continue to love and care for and cherish us. As we look to what God has said and done, we understand that when He saves us, that as He saves us, He enables us to serve Him. If it were anybody but God, that would be selfish. If what I did was to enable you to serve me, that would be very short-sighted. But because God is God, and serving Him is the highest joy and passion and wonder of our lives, when He makes us able to serve Him, He makes us able to live in a way that satisfies us. That when He makes us able to serve Him, that somehow serving Him turns out to be the perfect, most proper, most appropriate, most wonderful thing for us to do that gives us the greatest benefit in the midst of benefiting Him. And because He's God, He can work out how that comes together. Then Zechariah turns and he addresses John. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, 
For you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet onto the path of peace. John comes. He comes to tell the people that God is doing something new. He comes to lead the people to what is commonly called a baptism of repentance. That when John comes, what he preaches is that we have fallen short of what God desires of us. That our lives are not what he wants them to be. And that the proper response to God in that place is to come to him and say, God, I'm sorry. You're right and I'm wrong. Your way is good and my way is not like your way. I have disobeyed you. So often within our, our lives as human beings, we spend our time fooling ourselves, thinking we're better than we are, thinking we have obeyed rules that we've only bent them instead of broken them, that we've only done a little bit wrong in some of something that's truly devastating, that when we've hurt someone else, we've hurt them a little bit, and when they hurt us, they hurt us a lot. We spend our time doing that, but what God says through John is that the right response to our sin is repentance, is coming before him and saying, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. And you know, amazingly, just as those are the key words to enable friendship, and the key words to strengthen marriage, and the key words to strengthen your ability to parent your children and be a good child to your parent, they are also the key words to our relationship with God. I'm sorry. I was wrong. When we come to God in that attitude, he works in our heart. It says that he did this to give us the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of our sins because of the tender mercy of our God. God wants us to come to him and confess. He doesn't want us to come to him and confess because he wants to hold it against us. Or he wants to, to look down on us and say, see what you've done wrong. He doesn't do it because he wants to mark in his grade book the places we, we messed up. He does it because he wants to forgive us. And what's, what's even more amazing about that is that it's not because God needs us to say we're sorry for us to be forgiven. You see, we were forgiven by what Christ did on the cross. We are already forgiven for what we've done wrong and everything we're going to do wrong. In God's economy, it's off the books. And we have nothing between us and him. Now, the reason God wants us to come and to confess our sins to him is because that's the only way we will know we're forgiven. It's the only way we will believe that he has really let go of them. And it's the only way we will ever be able to forgive ourselves for the things that we've done wrong. It says that Christ came to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Our sin forms a shadow of death over us. Our choices to disobey God form a shadow of death over us. And the way out of that shadow is that Jesus comes and shines his light and dispels it. And in that light, yes, how far we are from God is revealed. How far we have to go between who we are and who God wants us to be is revealed in the light of Christ. And, and our instinct and our desire is to run from that. Is to be afraid of that. Is to say, no, 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 God, don't, don't look at me like this. Don't see me like this. And I don't want anybody else to know that I've got these problems and these flaws and these difficulties. But when we come to Christ and he shines that light on us, it is so that. He can forgive us because he does love us, because he tenderly extends his mercy to us. And when we let Jesus forgive us, we can know that we're forgiven. We can let go of the mistakes and the evil of the past, and we can step forward on that path of following Christ. My encouragement to you this morning is to let the light of Jesus shine into your heart. Let him reveal where repentance is needed. Let him reveal what you want to hide and don't want to face. And 
to let him forgive. Trust in him. Know him. 